You know, in the almost 20 years since I saw my first Malick, I think I finally figured out how to watch one of his movies. Oh? Yeah. And first off, you don't look for a linear narrative. Don't worry about the story, the plot, or even necessarily any character development, because Malick's no longer concerned about those things. You look for themes and recurring visual motifs. And then you kind of get a loose idea of where he's going and what he's doing. Not on the first watch, obviously, because his films always improve upon repeat viewings. On the first watch, you just sort of experience the movie. Let it wash over you. Surrender to the film and let it take you where it wants to go. But if you're sensitive to certain ideas and images, even though you may not know what it means yet, I think you can sort of anticipate what he's going to do next. Can you expand on that some? It's kind of vague. Like, the movie opened up with one of my favorite pieces of music, Exodus, by the Polish composer Wojciech Kielar. <laughs> Look at you, fancy pants. Oh, thank you. Anyway, I began to notice that he returned to it every time that the film had one of its chapter breaks that were based on a different tarot card. At a certain point, I predicted that he was also going to end the movie. We've been here. I remember that day. So much anticipation for a shared experience. A mutual. Teeth. And, of course, the various dogs that kept appearing throughout. I think that was significant, too. Huh. You want to know how I've learned to watch a Malik film? How? Avoid sitting next to 20-something-year-old dudes who come five minutes after the movie start and proceed to snicker through chunks of the film. Oh, is that what they did? Yep. It wasn't terrible, and if it had gotten too bad, I would have moved, but it was enough that I shot them a couple looks. Well, I didn't know that they did that. I saw them come in and sit down a couple seats away from you. And it's not like there weren't plenty of other places to sit. Yeah, it was pretty empty. I noticed there were like four or five people who left and didn't come back in. Oh, really? Yeah, and I found myself wondering, why did you come? What kind of movie did you think you were going to see? Were you just super stoked there was a new Brian Dennehy movie out? <laughs> so, I'll say this. I still have some of the same issues with Malick and women that I first noticed into The Wonder and that brought about that whole fiasco when we saw it. Oh yeah, which we won't get into. <laughs> right. But what I appreciated in this one is that while I still feel like he typically uses women as a shortcut to represent and symbolize solutions and meanings in life, I don't think he used them to represent answers in this. I get that Bale was searching for meaning and that he's going from complex ethereal woman to complex ethereal woman trying to find answers, but I don't think that any of them symbolized that in the same way that I felt like the women in To the Wonder did, which is mainly what I flipped out about back then. I mean, you and I have actually had discussions about that kind of thing. Finding meaning in other people or even finding meaning in ourselves versus finding meaning in something outside ourselves. It's far too easy, I think, to expect to find Why answers. Why are we like this? Can we help ourselves? Are we really two separate people? Or are we two halves of the same? Yeah, I think that's especially evident in the movie tonight. I was relieved to find women in a Malick film not being used in that way that just grinds my gears. Huh. Well, I thought that all the women that he had relationships with in this one were... As lost as he was? Yeah. Except for maybe Frida Pinto, who seemed to be more spiritual and consequently more centered than the rest. But mostly, I thought that all the women that he had relationships with were very distinct and different women. I mean, anyone who criticizes this by saying that they were all essentially the same woman was not watching the same movie that I was. Mm. I know I've said this before, but while I can understand why some people just wouldn't respond to the type of films that Malik is making, some of the criticisms that are aimed at him are so baseless. Mm, like what? Well, like one person said that they thought he needed to do some screenwriting again because his last two films didn't really have a script. Their point, I think, was that Malik needs to move away from this sort of 
freestyle organic filmmaking process that he's been doing recently and return to something a bit more traditional like he did in his early films. <laughs> That's not going to happen. <laughs> no, no, it's not. But even if it did, I think that is absolutely the wrong thing that he could do. Because then he becomes just like every other director that's working out there right now. See, Malik is a unique visionary, and he has a unique way of... These memories are distant selves. Remain fixed. Forever locked in time. Have we changed more than the seasons that passed since then? The world revolves... Lights come in. The cycle will continue. Blame him for not telling a good story in one of his new movies is to blame him for not doing something that he no longer intends to do in the first place. You know, Robert Altman was once asked why Hollywood has a hard time selling his movies, and his response was that they're in the business of selling boots and I make gloves. I think the same can be said of Malick. And criticizing his storytelling is like complaining that his gloves don't fit our feet. That's what I think, anyway. You know, I've heard you say that Altman thing before. Oh, really? Yeah, many times. Like, a lot, a lot. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I just think it's such a great quote. Right?